Oh, sorry, I, I needed to flip that switch. Without audio, pictures lose a lot of their meaning. I mean, silent films were wonderful, but the industry really took off with the advent of talkies, films with synchronized soundtracks. When we're shipping video around a car, sometimes it's okay if the images are silent. After all, I don't need to hear what's going on when I'm using the rear view camera. But for the backseat entertainment system, do you really think the kids will keep still if their favorite cartoon is silent? <laughs> Didn't think so. So while audio is a given for some video systems, it's not essential for every video feed. Maxim makes GMSL serializer deserializer systems both with and without audio. And within a system that supports digital audio, it's most often carried over I2S. I2S stands for Enter IC Sound and it does pretty much what the name implies. It moves audio from one device in a system to another device in the same system. It's the most popular interface for audio codecs and it's a well-established mature protocol. To understand how it works, we need to cover a few audio basics first. For most consumer audio uses, stereo sound is a given, and for that you need two channels, left and right, and you need a frequency response that's linear and flat from about 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. To get to 20 kilohertz, Nyquist tells us that we need to sample at some rate greater than twice the highest frequency. And that's why digital compact discs set a 44,100 sample per second standard, and DVDs use 48,000 samples per second. Both are comfortably above the Nyquist limit for a 20 kilohertz audio signal. And then there's the question of how many bits per sample. Both CDs and DVDs can use 16-bit linear PCM, and DVDs support 24-bit linear PCM. So let's use CD quality audio as a baseline. Two channels of audio, each channel sampled at 44,100 samples per second, and each sample 16 bits. Now, you can go lower and higher than that benchmark, Telephone quality audio is often coded at 8,000 samples per second, each sample 8 bits coded in a nonlinear fashion. And some high resolution products might take as many as 192,000 24 bit samples per second. But here's the thing I2S is flexible, it'll support pretty much any sample rate and at any sample depth. Now, of course, the transmitter and the receiver have to agree on the sample rate, but I2S sends along a sample clock so the receiver can easily determine what sample rate the transmitter is using. And I2S has an elegant solution to the problem of agreeing on a sample depth. The solution is to send all samples most significant bit first. If the transmitter and receiver agree on the number of significant bits, but well, fine. The transmitter sends, let's say, 16 bits, and the receiver gets those 16 bits, and all is well. But what if the transmitter is sending 24 bits, but the receiver can only accept 16? Well, easy. The receiver just discards the least significant 8 bits, and everybody is happy. The transmitter is providing the highest quality signal it can, and the receiver is interpreting the signal as best it can. But what if the situation is reversed? The transmitter is sending 16 bits per sample, but the receiver can accept 24 bits? Well, the receiver accepts the 16 bits, but when it sees the end of sample marker, it just fills in the rest, the low order 8 bits, with zero values. And once again, the transmitter is providing the highest quality signal it can, and the receiver is interpreting the signal as best it can. So the rule is that if the transmitter is sending more bits per sample than the receiver can use, well, the receiver just drops the low order bits that it doesn't need. And if the transmitter is sending fewer bits than the receiver actually wants, the receiver just fills in the low order bits with zero. And since everything is transmitted most significant bit first, Adjusting for the word length is really easy. 
In real-world I2S systems, it's not unusual to see the system sample size set to 24 or 32 bits, but to send samples with only 16 significant bits. In our system, we're going to assume that the transmitter and receiver are using 16-bit samples and the system sample width is 24 bits. In any I2S system, the transmitter drives the samples onto a data circuit, usually called SD for serial data. In our example, the transmitter sends the left sample, MSB first, and then 8 bits of zero. Then the transmitter sends the right sample, MSB first, and again, 8 bits of zero. One of the two parties, either the transmitter or the receiver, must generate a bit clock, most often called B clock in the documentation for most codecs, but usually called SCK in GMSL documentation. Whichever party is generating the bit clock is designated the master, and the other party is the slave. Now, regardless of whether it's operating as a master or slave, the transmitter typically changes the state of SD on the falling edge of the clock, and it expects the receiver to sample the data on the rising edge. Whichever party is the master also generates a left-right clock. Now, again, the name for this signal is different if you're looking at codec documentation, where it's typically called LR clock, or GMSL documentation, where we call it WS for word select. The word select signal is low during the left channel samples and high during right channel samples. If the transmitter is the master, it changes the state of the WS signal one cycle ahead of the most significant bit for the other channel. That lets the receiver know that it can move the finished sample to the output buffer and prepare for the next sample. If the receiver is the master, WS lets the transmitter know that in one clock's time, it should begin sending the MSB of the sample for the designated channel. And that's I2S. In this example, we're sampling at the CD standard rate, 44,100 samples per second. Although each sample is 16 bits, we frame it in a 24-bit field, and there are two channels. And that means the SCK signal will be running at just a little over 2 megahertz. 2 megahertz. Well, that's not too fast by today's standards. But keep in mind that WS and SD have to be synchronized to the edges of SCK. That's why I2S is usually found connecting ICs together on a single board or in a single box and not at the end of a long cable but at the end of a long cable is exactly where we're likely to encounter synchronized audio and video in automotive applications. So how do we get audio from point A, the electronics control unit, to point B, the backseat entertainment system, over a long cable? Well, one way would be to go old school, movies had soundtracks that were separate from the image frame. Television had an FM subcarrier for audio that was separate from the video carrier. Well, why not just perform the digital to analog conversion in the ECU and send the audio that way? After all, that's how we did it back in the VCR days. But see, that's exactly what we're trying to avoid. Every conductor in the cable is an additional expense and an additional point of failure. And when we begin switching video sources, it, it sure would be nice if the audio came along with it. Well, as you may have guessed, GMSL has an answer. Now remember, in GMSL we're sending pixels from the serializer to the deserializer, but in a serial format. That is, the serializer takes one pixel likely consisting of multiple color channels that are sampled at some bit depth, and serializes the bits of the pixel to be reconstructed in the deserializer. And we've already seen that for a high-definition image, we'll need to send something over 60 million pixels per second from the serializer 
to the deserializer. And that is, we're going to send on the order of 60 million pixel frames that contain sampled pixel information every second. But remember, we only need about 2 million bits per second to support high quality audio. Well, that means if we wanted to, we could just sample the data, the bit clock, and the word select clock on every pixel and tack those three bits onto the serial stream. And it would be just as if the receiving codec were connected directly to the sending codec, right? Well, sure, except for that little word sample. Since the pixel clock is not synchronized with the audio bit clock, the pixel clock won't sample the audio bit clock in exactly the same spot every time. And that means jitter. And jitter is the enemy of good quality audio reproduction. Different codecs handle jitter differently, so you'll need to check the datasheet for your receiving codec to make sure it can handle the jitter introduced into the audio bit clocks. Three bits. The bit clock, word select, and the data. But think about it. If we're sending an RGB signal, six or eight bits per color per pixel, plus three bits for synchronization, adding another three bits for audio increases the bandwidth requirement by as much as 14%. Can't we do better than that? Well, yes. The i square s bits change slowly from the perspective of a 60 megahertz pixel clock. Why not just encode those three bits onto a single bit in the pixel frame and call that bit the audio channel bit or the ACB? Well, that's exactly what the serializer does. It takes in an i square s stream and encodes it into a single bit that's transmitted with every pixel frame. Then in the deserializer, the bit can be picked off and reconstituted into the three constituent signals, data, bit clock, word select. Let's take this a little bit further. The left-right clock can be extended to become a sort of framing signal so you can send more than two channels if you want. After all, there's plenty of bandwidth in the serial bitstream. Just how might we pack more channels in? Well, it's actually a little more straightforward than you might think. Just send half the channels while word select is low and the other half while word select is high. Send the channels in whatever format you like with as many padding bits as you like up to eight channels and up to 32 bits per channel. Now, strictly speaking, this is no longer an I square S signal. It's a TDM signal. TDM stands for time division multiplex. And while it may sound a little exotic, it's not unusual. And eight channels maps really nicely into the 7.1 audio that's supported in the Blu-ray standard. The only limitation is that the more channels you have and the more bits per channel, the faster the pixel clock must be to support that audio format. Now, in this chart, you can see that our base case, two channels of 16-bit samples, is fully supported for up to 192 kilosamples per second across all pixel clock frequencies. And if you have a 100 megahertz pixel clock frequency, then you can support eight channels of 32-bit audio at 192 kilosamples per second, the fastest supported standard rate. Between these two extremes, there are trade-offs, sample rate, bit depth, and the number of channels, and you can select them for any given pixel clock. That's how Maxim serializers and deserializers get audio in whatever format you have it, from one point to the other. Stay tuned for more about Maxim's GMSL products.